Hello, Michael. How's it going? Hey, how's it going, Logan? What's up? Not much. Um, it looks like Rebecca tried to join and then um, had uh, she froze. And so she's probably just figuring out uh, connectivity and whatnot. Um, you know how it goes with this virtual world. <laughs> I do indeed. Is there, uh, I think if push came to shove, I could do this without Rebecca. Let me see what I got here. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and um, I just started this session, so we got a couple of attendees already joining, so just want to let you know. Um, welcome to those uh, uh, that are joining. We'll give it a few minutes um, just to see if um, we've got another panelist that might be joining us or presenter. Um, so we'll just give it a few minutes and then also wait for, for attendees to join. Um, okay. So yeah, um, and, then, and then you can, I'll introduce myself and you'll introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, so, good. and I'm su assuming you're very familiar with the, um, webinar style and whatnot for for zoom <laughs> uh not exactly um i just i use zoom for for teaching but uh you 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 will allow me to share the screen if if rebecca doesn't show up yes um in fact i'll just preemptively just make you a well you already you already are a co-host so um you should be able to do um the sharing the screen and and, and whatnot um, and okay. all the other um any other things um so yeah and then um if people have questions throughout the session um, please feel free to put it in the Q&A section um, and then any general information, um, whether it be a link or anything or if it, any other um, things that might come up, put it in the chat. Um, okay, sounds uh, good. Yeah. Hi, Rebecca. How's it going? Oh. <laughs> Looks like we got you connecting. <laughs> Oh. Hello, can you hear us? Are you good now? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a good... Hey, Logan, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I can hear you just fine. All right. Somehow I have been kicked out of my internet at an inopportune moment. So I've got you on the phone, but I think that this will be good. Hi, yeah. Mike. Hi, Rebecca. Can you, you're going to have to speak a little louder, at least for me. Is she coming through for you, Logan? Yeah, she's coming through. I had to kind of turn my, my volume up a little bit on my laptop. Um, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Mike, I'll keep trying to get on line, but if I can't get on, can you use the, the most recent link that I sent you to screen share? Yes, I think I can. And if I just click the go button on that video, it will run right out of here. Yeah, there's a, exactly, yeah, within the presentation, if you click the link, it will go, and Logan, if you give me one minute, I'll try again, but I, you probably saw me, like, 10 minutes ago, I joined, and then I disappeared. Yes, yeah, I saw so, it, like, right when you joined, you just froze, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can handle it, don't worry about it, Rebecca, if you, if, it, if you get kicked off, I'll just pick up wherever you are. Sounds good. Right. And um, I'll just go ahead, because it's a few minutes in, um, I'll just introduce myself, and then each of you all can introduce yourselves, and then go for it. Um, so my name is Logan Reed. I am an assistant dean of admission at William and Mary. And when I'm not, you know, planning and executing and doing these wonderful admitted student events, I'm also reading applications and traveling to various high schools and whatnot. Um, so I'm one of the full staff members in the admission office. And I'm happy that you all are here for to attend this session to learn more about William and Mary and the various opportunities that you have here on our campus. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Michael and Breck, if you all want to introduce yourselves and we'll get going. All right. I'm Mike Tierney. I'm a professor in the government department. I teach international relations and international political economy. And I'm also the director at here at the Global Research Institute. And Rebecca and I are going to talk a little bit more about that uh, briefly and then take questions from you all. Hey, thanks so much for coming. Um, and at five o'clock, no less, glad to glad to be here with you. I'm Rebecca Latorell, Director of Programs and Outreach at the Global Research Institute, and looking forward to chatting with you about how you can get involved in undergraduate research at GRI. Mike, do you mind doing a screen share of the presentation? Sure, I can do that. Well, we'll see whether I can do that. Uh, let's see here. Yes, there we go. All right. You. 
Sorry. Struggling to find it. Well, well, Mike is working on the screen share. I will start by saying that the GRI's mission um, is to empower teams of William and Mary students and faculty to make a difference in the world. We are a multidisciplinary hub drawing from across campus, and we apply scholarly research to real world problems. We invest in outstanding student and faculty scholars to catalyze new insights and cultivate the next generation of global leaders. And then a little bit about how we do that. Um, we identify promising ideas, and those might come from students or faculty. Um, we make investments in pilot ideas and sort of running things at a small scale to see if they have legs and then scaling them. And then beyond scaling, we help sustain research labs. There are 10 different research labs you'll hear about in a minute that sit underneath the umbrella of the Global Research Institute. Um, but uh, better than hearing me talk to you about our mission, um, we worked with William & Mary's videography team to create a video about um, our work and our ethos. And we wanted to take just a few minutes and play that for you now. So what would it look like to have a multidisciplinary research institute that was dedicated to the idea of promoting student-faculty research collaboration to address real-world problems? At its core, the institute is really a community of both faculty and student scholars and practitioners who are committed to doing research and creating new knowledge that will make a difference in the world. The idea with the Institute is to bring people out of their respective disciplines and departments around problems. What you see in the hallway or at the water cooler is geographers and economists working together. It's kind of like those think tanks that are in Silicon Valley where you have all kinds of people coming together and sharing ideas. Problems in the real world don't respect disciplinary boundaries, and we don't either. In American education, we tend to emphasize the differences of culture, societies, economies and when you have an opportunity to actually do applied research overseas, you in fact are struck by how people have the same aspirations, whether you're in Tanzania or Williamsburg, Virginia. I met someone through the Institute DC Day, and so we got sushi burritos like the next week because I happened to be in DC, and I was like, this is awesome, and I'm gonna apply and I found out that I had gotten the job, and that's because of the Institute. My mom was really happy, because it was great. And you have to show us the William Mary and the Institute have created generations of, of globally minded and engaged students. I became interested in data visualization because of the Institute. My closest friends worked with me at the Institute, and I still stay in touch with them to this day. The students are our research collaborators, but they're also family friends. How am I going to make a difference in the world? How am I going to change the status quo? We had the opportunity to practice these skills while we were there. I hope that, you know, 10 years from now, that I could hire a student coming out of the Institute. I knew there was a place I could actually be comfortable and get to know people and learn and develop as a student. I found mentors, I found friends, I found future professional colleagues, I found just a lifelong passion for asking the tough questions. We're already one of the best places to get a degree in international relations. We aspire to be the best place to do undergraduate research and we're well on our way. We didn't seek out to construct a great culture and a great community, but our approach to research, I think, has done exactly that.
All right. So that's some high quality propaganda. Um, it, hey, Logan, are you uh, are you still on the call? Yep, I'm still here. So are these students uh, all coming to William Mary or are they still making their decision? So they are all admitted students, but they might not, they may or may not have deposited. Good. Got it. Okay. Understand. Like committed. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll take a few minutes and just describe briefly um, the, the research labs that are located here at the Institute. As Rebecca said, we are a multidisciplinary hub. And so we have nine, well, we really have 10, but I won't, I won't tell you about the 10th one yet. We have nine main projects here. And they're, all those projects are led by principal investigators or faculty researchers. And then all of the labs contain multiple student researchers. Um, after I go through very briefly these, uh, these different labs, the, the sort of alphabet soup of labs here, then I will uh, tell you a couple stories uh, that I think are illustrative of the way, we, the way that we work. And I will turn it back over to Rebecca to talk about some of the programs that are here at GRI. Uh, and then really just want to save time for a conversation. I'm sure you all have questions. So I'm just going to go in order of the labs you see here on the screen. Um, Aid Data is the largest research lab here at GRI. It has about 35 full-time employees and in any given year employs over 100 students. Um, Aid Data is a research lab designed to sort of understand the causes and effects of foreign aid and other types of development finance. So that's the core approach, but a whole bunch of other interesting research projects have spun off from that, one of which I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. The IGNITE lab is run by a spatial epidemiologist named Carrie Dolan in our health sciences department. Um, she tries to understand how different interventions within a given country based on their location, how those different interventions shape health outcomes. Uh, she's done a lot of work studying malaria, HIV AIDS, and now, as you might guess, she's studying COVID. Uh, in addition to doing uh, research in Latin America and Africa, Carrie is on the team here at William & Mary that has led the university response to the pandemic. So I don't think she sleeps, but she's a great teacher and a great um, researcher. Nuke Lab is run by uh, Professor Jeff Kaplow. He studies, as you might guess by the name, nuclear deterrence and nuclear proliferation. Jeff tries to understand the causes of proliferation and how the international community might constrain proliferation through bilateral policies and through multilateral institutions. Uh, TRIP is the Teaching, Research, and International Policy Project. That's a project that's sort of more meta. One of the things you'll notice and one of the things Rebecca said is that all of these projects are policy relevant or they're, they're relevant to the practice of international relations, not just the study of international relations. Well, TRIP is the project that sort of takes a step back and it asks not, you know, what are the causes of nuclear proliferation or how do we explain human rights outcomes? TRIP asks, what is the relationship between the academy, that is what we research and do teaching on in universities, what is the relationship between the academy and the policy world? And so we do that by uh, doing surveys of policymakers and think tankers and people who work in the academy. And we also do textual analysis. We turn text into data uh, to analyze the corpus of research done in the international relations discipline. The blockchain lab is one of our newer labs, just like it sounds. Uh, Troy Wapungui uh, is trying to, uh, he's working with students to try to understand how distributed ledger technology can be used to solve real world problems. So for Troy, that's mostly focused on international development, supply chains, and then smart contracts. And those have lots of applications if you're interested in international relations or global policy. The Project on International Peace and Security, or PIPS, is an undergraduate think tank. So you can think Brookings Institute for 18 and 19 year olds. And this is a, a, a relatively small project where Professor Amy Oakes and Dennis Smith work very closely with William and Mary students on a year long project. Each, each of the seven fellows that's selected every year works on a year long project on some over the horizon uh, issue in international security or US foreign policy. They present their research, I think you saw in the film, students presenting up at the National Press Club or at Brookings, that's, that's the PIPS project. 
Um, the ABC project is the American Bosnia collaboration. This is the longest running service project at William and Mary. Obviously, it's set in a post conflict country of Bosnia Herzegovina. And uh, the principal investigator on that project has added a research component to the service element of the ABC project. So they're trying to understand what type of educational interventions will, will enhance cross ethnic and cross religious cooperation from different communities. In this case, it's Muslims and Christian Orthodox uh, junior high school students. The International Justice Lab studies international justice and human rights. Uh, this, is, this lab is led by Kelly Drogbo, who's a new professor in the government department. Uh, she works at the intersection of international law and political science in order to understand uh, uh, transitional justice and how what steps countries have tried to take after there was, after there was some injustice done, what, what steps do they try to take in order to reestablish justice in society? Um, if you've been following the news, you know that this is not just for South Africa or Argentina, but increasingly people are talking about transitional justice in the United States. Um, the ARC or the African Research Center, this is a newly renamed entity at William & Mary. Uh, just this weekend, we had our first ever um, uh, annual conference for students, faculty, and alums who work in or who work on or who are from Africa. And so this used to be called the Center for African Development. And then that was sort of broken into two different chunks, one that focuses on digital equality and one that is this sort of convening entity. Their, their ethos is to bring Africa to William and & Mary and to bring William & Mary to Africa. So that was probably more than you wanted to know, but it does give you a sense of the breadth of the research that's done here, right? It's not just guns and bombs and war. It's not just human rights. It's sort of the range of issues you might cover in global policy. Uh, one of the things that Rebecca said early on was that all of our research labs here are collaborative, right? So this is not a model where you pick a really smart professor and send him or her into the library or to the supercomputer or out to do field research. This is an institute that supports collaborative research. So that means faculty are working with other faculty, they're working with international partners, and most importantly, they're working with William and Mary students on their research. So William and Mary students here, they are not you know, test tube washers, William and Mary students are directly involved as research collaborators in all these labs. Happy to talk more about the specifics if, if you're interested. Um, I'm going to tell you two stories, and then I'm going to turn the, the mic back over to Rebecca, and then we can do some, some questions. So the first story I want to tell you about is uh, the story. It, this, this is a project, uh, a research project that came out of a class. So there's a, there was a class taught here at William & Mary by the chief social scientist at Aid Data. And I, I, I already told you about Aid Data as the largest lab. The class was about field experiments and randomized controlled trials. How can we use the same methods that medical researchers use to test the efficacy and the safety of vaccines? How can we use those same research methods to understand political outcomes and outcomes in international development? Right, so that was the class. And so the, the class was an interesting mix of students. I think there were eight or nine William and Mary students in the class. There were five or six professional staff from GRI. In fact, Rebecca was one of the people enrolled in that class. And then there were six or seven faculty members who wanted to learn this new method to support their research. I was one of the faculty members enrolled in the class. So I was taking class with Rebecca and with 18 and 19 year olds. Well, one of the, the main assignment in the class was to work collaboratively with a team and come up with a randomized control trial that you could actually implement in the field. So the final product was write a proposal for an RCT. And then, you know, if you're really excited, you can go out in the world and actually conduct the research. Well, I'd, I don't know if I failed the class, but I did not come up with this great idea that has changed the world. Um, Rebecca probably did. But uh, Phil Ressler, one of our 
faculty uh, mentors in the class, he came up with a great idea, right? So Melinda Gates and Sherry Blair were talking a lot about how cell phone technology was gonna revolutionize development, how if cell phone ownership could be dramatically expanded to women in developing countries, this would make them more politically effective. It would allow them to earn higher incomes and it would give them autonomy in ways that they didn't have today. And there were good theoretical reasons for thinking this. But the idea had never been tested systematically. Right? We had observational data, but no one had ever done an experiment. No one had ever done for cell phones in sub-Saharan Africa what we have recently done with uh, COVID vaccines. Right? We never randomly assigned who would get the treatment and who would get the control. And so that was the idea that Phil Ressler and his students came up with. Uh, they had an idea. They said, hey, if we can have a small investment of $20,000, we can go do a pilot study in Tanzania uh, to see whether or not this idea, you remember, people are spending millions of dollars at this time selling or more likely giving out cell phones to women in, in the belief that it was going to have some revolutionary effect. It would, it would be as if you were testing drugs without ever doing a randomized control trial. So Phil and his students, uh, you know, GRI made a, a small investment. Phil and his students went to Tanzania, did a pilot study. They got really interesting results. And then uh, they sent the results and a proposal to the Gates Foundation, and then subsequently to the National Science Foundation. So that research has scaled. And they're now not only doing it nationwide in Tanzania, but they're also in Liberia, and I believe in uh, Malawi, doing that now. So that's one cool story. The student that you see here is, is uh, Peter Young. Uh, he, this is a picture of him in Liberia doing field research with, uh, with Phil. The second story and the last thing I'll tell you is a story about aid data. So aid data has been around since 2003 and the person running that project here at GRI now is named Brad Parks. But Brad, who was my student, is now a faculty member at Wayman Mary and he's running aid data. Um, he had a student back in, I think, 2012, named Austin Strange. And Austin was doing an independent study with Brad on what is the impact of Chinese foreign aid and Chinese development finance in Sub-Saharan Africa? How would, I, how would I guesstimate how much China is spending and what are its effects in Sub-Saharan Africa? So he's gonna read all the literature and on a weekly basis, the faculty member gets together with the student, talks about what they've learned, the students writing a literature review and a paper. And near the end of the semester, Austin said, hey, I just had an interesting conversation with these folks at the World Bank. They're trying to use media sources to estimate how much China is giving in Africa. I think we could do this if I could have 10 or 12 other students who could work with me all summer. I think we could come up with a better method for tracking Chinese foreign aid and development finance than what the World Bank is doing. And the bank is willing to give us their methodology and give us the data that they have uh, because they don't want to do it anymore. It's become a hot potato for the World Bank. Uh, they'd, love, they'd love it to be located at a, at a research university. And so long story short, Brad persuaded me to make a small investment to pay students to stay in Williamsburg for the summer and to work on the methodology and then to do a pilot version of the data set where they would use open sources to collect information at the project level about Chinese development finance and Chinese foreign aid, right? So for in, in China, foreign aid and foreign aid allocation is a state secret. So no one knows officially because China doesn't report to the OECD. They don't report to the United Nations. No one knows exactly what China is doing in Africa um, until now. And so to make a super long story short, uh, that initial and small investment, paying William and Mary students enough money to buy their pizza here in Williamsburg for the summer has turned into a multi-million dollar research operation with contracts at the Gates Foundation, USAID, the State Department, et cetera. So now I don't know if you, if you read The Economist or if you read The Wall Street Journal, um, you read The Washington Post, over the last two weeks, you've seen a lot of coverage about this aid data research. Um, that analyzes how China gives loans. Uh, there's been over 300 media hits within the last two weeks 
And this is all research that came out of a student idea supported by fact, a collaboration with faculty. So those are two stories that I think are illustrative of what is possible with collaborative research here at GRI. I think uh, Rebecca now is gonna talk about some of the cross-cutting programs before we turn to Q&A. And before I talk about the cross-cutting programs, Mike, do you think it's now 400, 500 or more students who've worked on building the different data sets that are part of that um, tracking Chinese development finance project? Yeah, uh, I would say definitely over 200 on that. So you figure 13 years, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably over 300 now. Yeah. Because right now, today they have, right today they have 24 students working on the project. Yeah. All right, so Mike talked to you about the different research labs that are under the Global Research Institute and students can get involved in a variety of ways in those labs, but we also offer cross-cutting programs that are not restricted to participation in a research lab that are open to students Again, multidisciplinary across campus, drawing from lots of different majors and backgrounds and also class years. And one of them is our summer fellows program. Um, in a typical non-pandemic year, we send about 20 students to work with, under, with William and Mary faculty or partner organizations around the world. Um, so two years ago, we had, I think, two dozen students in 12 different countries working on a wide range of projects from developing um, online dashboards to track uh, school outcomes in the Philippines to working on implementing a randomized control trial like Mike described. And um, so lots of range, uh, both in terms of location, skill sets required, and also, again, background and age of the students that participate. Um, and Mike, would you mind playing a quick video about the Summer Follows program? I had no idea. Oh, cool. We do have a video. I had no idea. We're working with Will Smith, who is a William & Mary alum, who has co-founded a school in Monrovia, Liberia, Monrovia Football Academy. We're conducting an impact evaluation as to whether MFA's program, you know, combining sport and education is really viable in encouraging growth and development of a lot of the kids involved in the program. Testing MFA's mission statements is like general equality, non-cognitive skills, and leadership skills, and also like success in academic places. So testing that versus regular students who did not get in, or students who did not make the cut. Sport and development is a new field, and so our research, we're hoping to fill that gap and see is this structure actually something that is sustainable and useful and can be potentially applied in other contexts. What's so exciting about this project is that it's really a former student at William Mary who's inspiring us at the college to study this research question. We've been doing a lot of field research and running around Monrovia and outside Monrovia, going to schools and contacting these kids. Yeah, I like Barcelona City. My favorite team is Manchester City. Just really trying to meet with these families, like develop a personal relationship, tell them about the football festival that we're holding next week, in which we'll test a lot of these modules and see whether these kids are meeting the standards of the program. And so it's really helpful um, for you to come to the football festival in order to partake and help us with our research. Yeah, so do you think you would like to come? Yes. Great. Smart Liberia is an organization committed to getting Liberians to go to university and then come back to Liberia in order to help them grow and develop. So they've been helping us get in contact with parents and local community leaders to bridge that gap between our different communities and different cultures. So students are collaborators in the full sense of the word. Whereas they are here on the ground, they worked of course in the classroom to design the study, they helped to design these research projects, they helped to write instruments and protocols that we use in, in the field, and then they help in implementation and they help in data analysis. So the students have to really step up and shoulder a lot of responsibility, and they are just thriving. MFA has the potential to truly be transformative because it gets these students excited about going into class. 
education should not just be all academic. Just helping these kids see themselves as part of like a whole society regardless of their gender. That's something that's been very, very important to me and I wish like most schools would look at what MFA is doing here. I wanted to become a summer fellow just because I wanted to find a way that my passion for international development could be actualized and to see that what I was learning in the classroom was really effective in the field and that it meant something. There's something that we can do to change things like working with them at MFA and meeting people all around Monrovia who have that same approach, that's been a rewarding experience and something that like I left at as soon as the summer fellowship was provided. I think to be able to claim ownership of your research, you have to have been there through every step and we wouldn't be able to claim that, that we understand this situation that we are doing research on if we weren't here while we were doing it. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of the flavor of one project in particular. Um, but as I mentioned, they span a wide range. Um, you heard Mike talk a bit about student innovation and kind of the way that student ideas, whether they're born in the classroom together with faculty as your, stu or your fellow students, um, or a student coming to a faculty member and saying, hey, I, I really want to, you know, test out this research idea. I think it has legs. This could be useful um, to the policy and practitioner community. That's really part of GRI's origin, and it's something that we have kind of continued to deliberately bake into our programming, and we've done this in a couple of different ways. We've hosted pitch competitions. Um, on the left side of this slide, you can see students who were participating in a Shark Tank pitch competition where students competed for up to $20,000 in funding for their research. And we've also started offering um, a cyclical innovation funding window um, where students can, again, apply to get funding from GRI to pilot their research ideas. And that's something that is really important to us, not just because it's part of our origin story, but also because we've seen that this is where so many great ideas come from, is from that student innovation. We also, um, you may have gathered that we are not a degree granting unit, so you can't major or minor in GRI, though many of our students do end up spending a lot of time um, working on the research projects and also just hanging out on our front porch. Um, but we tend to offer classes when we can do something that is a bit different from the typical classroom experience, whether that is a program that meets on campus for several weeks and then goes to the field, a collaboration with the Washington Center in DC, um, or working with the Entrepreneurship Hub, the Public Policy Program, or the IR Program. We host a wide variety of events, um, and this is kind of like the least pressure way to dip your toe in the water. Um, when you come to William & Mary in the fall, we hope to see you um, at our events, and by then hope to be in person. But we run a variety of speaker series, panel events, um, primarily here in Williamsburg, a lot of them up on the third floor of our house on Scotland Street, um, and very often over food as well. So we hope you'll join us for lunch. We have an e-internship program as well. And this is something that um, you hear a ton about virtual internships today because of the pandemic. But this is a program that was virtual by design and has, was around for years before the pandemic. We were able to scale it up during the pandemic and offer um, last summer more than 60 students e-internships because we had the infrastructure in place. But our director of the e-internship program has really strong relationships across a wide range of organizations, um, a pretty heavy focus on national security um, and partnerships with various units of the military. Um, but again, a wide range of opportunities through the e-internship program where you can earn credit and be based in Williamsburg doing your coursework, but also gain that real world experience and to bolster your resume. And then last but not least, we hope that you'll join us, not just at William & Mary in the fall, but also that you'll come visit us on Scotland Street. Um, I mentioned getting together for lunch, but we also love to host barbecues out in our front yard. Um, and it's a really great place to build your intellectual community and 
share research ideas um, with faculty and other students alike. So happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Yeah, feel free to put the questions in the Q&A section um, and we'd be happy to answer them. Hey, Logan, is there any way just to let them in so we can see the humans and they can ask us questions or does this have to be text? We, yeah, uh, unfortunately, um, it's, we can't, we're unable to like, just, we can't easily change it over to um, okay. um, a meeting, I guess you could say for Zoom, it's either a webinar or a meeting. Um, okay. Yeah, that's something that in like next year, if we are able to, if we're still having something virtual, we'd probably do a little bit more meetings, but webinar uh, does make it have a higher capacity to have more students be able to participate where meetings has a limited number of um capacity for students. And then also um, sometimes the bandwidth can be hard if, if, if you have a lot of people. So yeah, totally <laughs> it's a good point though. Um, but yeah, if y'all want to put any questions you might have um, in the Q&A, um, that'd be great. Oh, uh, Rek, I think you're muted. You know, it's almost like we hadn't been doing this for the last 13, 14 months. Um, students on the call, you know, we would love to answer your questions about how to get involved with a research lab. If you have questions about the specific research taking place at GRI, questions about professional development opportunities, Mike's great classes that he teaches, you name it. We're happy to answer anything that's on your mind. Oh, and uh, Michael, if you wanna send that link out, uh, make sure you specify this. The default's always all panelists. Make sure you specify all panelists and attendees. Um, yeah, no, that always gets me. All right, so we got a question. So, um, what it what if any relationship do you have with the Monroe Scholars Program? Um, I'll go first. We don't have any formal relationship with the Monroe Scholars Program, but the person you know, the folks who run it over at the Charles Center, they're one of the way they see their task is to think about like where do I route route this particular student who's interested in biochemistry neuroscience, public policy, international development, whatever it is, to the right, not only the right courses, but to the right research opportunities. And so the Monroe Scholars are among the most active of our research assistants and our research collaborators here at GRI. So I don't, wouldn't say that we have a formal relationship with Monroe. We occasionally do a lunch series when we're asked to come over and talk to groups of Monroe's that are that are interested, but there's no formal affiliation. Yeah. Um, and so the next question, um, could you talk a little bit more about the science slash health related research opportunities through GRI and how you get involved? Right. OK, so I'm going to let Rebecca answer the how you can get involved in just a minute, um, because each lab is slightly different in the way that they bring students into, into their lab. Um, but so to focus on the substance of the question for a minute, on what types of, of research questions are done at IGNITE, which is the main research lab that's doing the work in the area of health science. I'd say actually there are, I would say there are two separate research projects at GRI that do work related to health and development. And those two projects are IGNITE, that's Carrie Dolan. She's the spatial epidemiologist. And so her projects uh, tend to be focused on using uh, spatial data, GIS, and using uh, uh, spatial statistics in order to understand the downstream effects of different public health interventions. So for example, if Carrie knew that in the country of Uganda, there were certain public health informational interventions that went out in, let's say, three languages, but not in the other 10 languages that are the most common in Uganda. She could look to see whether there were differential health effects of where the informational intervention worked, because she has geolocated data on health outcomes. So whether it's infection rates or whether it's number of deaths, uh, whether it's, you know, pick your you know, it, pick your, your health outcome that you're, that you're interested in, she could track the, the sort of likely impact of the informational intervention. What is more likely is she's tracking the impact of dollar investments. 
So maybe it's the government of Uganda that has spent more money on vaccines or the government of Uganda has spent more money on building local health clinics. What are the health effects of those interventions? Right? So that's carry uh, and that's ignite. And notice there, it's like very, so the, the work is epidemiological. The other project that does work in the area of health and development would be aid data. And that work is much more policy oriented than it is you know, tracking at the household level or tracking at the individual level, where is the spread of disease? Instead, in this case, they're trying to explain uh, reform in health policy rather than trying to explain sort of variation in health outcomes across you know, a country or a group of countries. So that's the substantive answer. Obviously, as you can tell, not my area of interest. Uh, Rebecca, how, how would students get involved in uh, Ignite and Aid Data? Yeah, of course. So the best way for students to stay abreast of all opportunities at GRI, kind of everything that we've talked about so far in this call, is to be on our digest list. You can sign up now if you're just curious to get a flavor. You don't have to have a William & Mary email address. And that's where we publish all student opportunities for employment with the labs. You can also feel free to always reach out directly to the folks who run the different research labs. Um, and all of their contact information is also on our website. And I'll drop both the, I'll drop the digest link into the chat. While Mike was talking, I also dropped in um, the Ignite Global Health website and included a sample publication that um, I think is emblematic of the type of work that Mike was talking about. I also wanted to mention um, one of our recently funded student innovation projects is focused on menstruation hygiene management in Venezuelan migrant communities. And that's a student idea that came out of the work that she did as a summer fellow in Bogota. Um, and her work doing needs assessments for migrant communities, identifying this as a gap. Um, and so she's working on that and actually hiring a team of students to work with her on that project. I guess if I was gonna give one last bit of advice, it would be, and so, yeah, it would be, it, it, think about how informality affects decisions that people make. So if you're a student in my class, the ease with which you can translate that experience into a job with Carrie Dolan is less than if you were in her class. So if you show up at William and Mary and you're interested in doing research, whether this is in chemistry or biology or in you know, foreign aid and development, a, a great idea would be to take the introductory classes, take the freshman seminars with faculty members who have active research, active research agendas. And so, as, as Rebecca said, we list all our faculty affiliates on our website. You can hunt them and say, all right, if I have to choose between taking a class from that old codger or from this, you know, young, brilliant scientist who is incredibly research active, there she is on the website. I'm signing up for her class. Yeah, and um, we have another question that came up. Someone's asked. Um, could you talk about examples of where students who have been involved in GRI have gone on to work after college? So, so like career paths? Yeah, it sounds like it's kind of a career path, like kind of where they, where do they end up, um, whether it be um, if they end up somewhere different or where do they end up after being involved in GRI after college, GRI? Rebecca, you want to go first? Yeah, so I was going to say... It, one of the fun things about being in our third floor student space in our office is a wall that is all little squares, stickers of places that students have gone on to work um, after being involved in GRI. And what I'm always impressed with is just the huge range because there are sort of the things that you would expect, government service, consulting um, firms that have a large public sector practice, but also places like Politico, CNN, The Intercept in the media space, you've got nonprofits around the world. Um, a lot of people who do go on to graduate school, we have a, a high number of people who've gone to the London School of Economics. Um, you have people really going all over the world and doing a wide variety of kind of functional roles. One of the key themes that we hear from people um, is that their work at GRI really helped prepare them in complementing their William and Mary studies, prepare them for work in the real world. Um, and then we often have alums who come to us, this happened just this morning, 
She said, I'm going to grad school. I'm leaving my job at the World Bank and I wanna find a great person who's got a William and Mary education and who worked at GRI. It prepared me so well for my job. And I know you can help me get the perfect person to leave my team in good hands with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know, Mike, if you have other specific examples you wanna share, but it's really fun, rewarding part of my job to see students go on to start their careers. Yeah, I would just say super eclectic, probably not surprising. You go to a great liberal arts college, you get exposed to a wide range of things. And so the number of things our students end up doing are, I would say, equally eclectic. Um, there are sort of hot trends, I, I suppose. And, you know, sort of, we're really good at data science and spatial data analysis. So more than our share of students end up going off to do policy analysis work using spatial data. But I mean, that's like 15, 10 to 15% of our students. I mean, our students go to the Peace Corps, they go to the Marine Corps, they go to banks, they go to PhD programs. They, they're quite, quite broad ranging. Yeah, I mean, that, that's awesome. Uh, we, we, I know we don't have any questions right now. So if I figured we could give it another minute or so, I'm sure people might be typing questions and whatnot. Um, if there's anything you all wanted to just talk about that you feel like is would add more value or be able to um, show these students and parents kind of what it would looks like to be a student on campus or um, I don't know, anything that you all wanted to mention, you can feel free to go for it. <laughs> I want to hear what, I want to hear students that haven't made up their mind yet. <laughs> what are you choosing between? You know, you're choosing between X and Y. I want to hear your, I want to hear your your choices, and then you articulate a question that will help you, help you make a decision, or maybe <laughs> maybe all the people on, on the line have already made their choice. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's usually a mix of them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I just had I just had both my kids graduate from university. So. Gotcha. I've just gone through this as a parent, uh, <laughs> the students making the choice and Ooh, you know, everybody's this, got to do their own thing. But here we've got, this is a, I mean, I'm saying it's a tough decision. I think I'm supposed to say, well, of course you would only choose William and Mary from these options, but these are really interesting and good options. University of Michigan honors, William and Mary, and then Kenyon with American. Yeah. Looks like they've got some great options, which is will you marry the canyon with America? Grant? Okay, I'll I'll say a couple of, of things that might be useful to more than one of you. So um, one of the things to one of the I think the, the key thing that sort of distinguishes universities or, or colleges, they they tend to fall in to two categories, right? With universities are, you know, elite schools are usually either great research institutions, or they are liberal arts colleges, right? And so, you know, truth in advertising, if you want to take classes from Nobel laureates, and you want to take people, take classes from people who are at the very, very top of their field, right? And you are, you have been admitted to, you know, U University of Michigan, or Harvard, or Princeton, or Yale, or, or whatever, you know, you, you see Berkeley. The, 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 the cutting edge nature of the research there is qualitatively different than you're gonna get anywhere else in the world. Like that is where the smartest people in the world are and they are focused almost entirely on producing new knowledge. Like that is their job, right? So their teaching loads are quite low. They don't teach many classes uh, and they have lots of teaching assistants that help them with their classes. But like the smartest people in the world are at those universities. So for that first, for the first student, University of Michigan, it's one of the ten best universities in the world for producing new knowledge. On the other end of the spectrum, you got schools like Swarthmore, Oberlin, Williams. Those schools, the student-faculty ratio is amazing. Those faculty, they are not hired to produce the next, to write the next great book, to win the Nobel Prize, to get published in Science. That is not what they're doing. They're there to educate students, undergraduate students, and help them to think clearly and critically and learn how to write, right? That's what they get paid for, and you'll get a great undergraduate education there. What you won't get at University of Michigan is you probably won't get a lot of face time or engagement with those Nobel Prize winners, 
right? You won't get a lot of time in the lab, or if you work in the lab of a, of a great scientist, you're probably interacting with his or her graduate student or his or her postdoc, right? You're not interacting with the Nobel laureate. Similarly, if you go over to Williams or Oberlin or Swarthmore, the probability that the faculty member is research active goes down precipitously. So the amount of cutting edge research that's done at liberal arts colleges is lower because faculty are not incentivized to do as much, re as much research. That's not how you get promoted at Williams or Oberlin. Truth in advertising, William and Mary is somewhat of a hybrid. So William and Mary has sort of liberal arts DNA baked in, especially for old people with gray hair like me. Like we think of ourselves as a liberal arts college, but we are also a research university, right? And the biggest difference, this is the, this is the one thing you'll rarely hear from an admissions, admissions officer at any of these institutions. The biggest difference between a place like William and Mary and a place like University of Michigan or Harvard or UVA is that we don't have PhD programs in the areas of research that we do here at, at GRI. So if you go to UVA, the professors are just as smart or smarter, but their main goal, their primary objective is to train the next generation of professors, right? They have PhD students and their job is to train PhD students. Right? Their job is not to spend their time with undergraduates. And so guess what? If you don't have PhD students and you want to do collaborative research, you do research with undergraduates. You do research with students. So to the extent that you think it's important to learn through research rather than to merely learn or only learn in the classroom, which is very important, then you know, William Mary becomes more attractive. Um, one thing I would say, I'm not familiar with Michigan's honors program. But if I was sending a kid to a Big Ten school or a big ACC school, any big public university, I would definitely want them to be in the honors college where you're going to get more hands-on connection to faculty than you would if you're in the general population. So have no idea if that helps you make a decision. Uh, I, I appreciate the candor from know, our professor. I usually think students will just know in their gut, this is where I belong. But without, without real visits, maybe that's not true. I don't know. All right. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. Because um, I think people, it's hard to know what the difference is, I think, amongst these thousands of colleges out there. And so that's something I'm always trying to help students is figure out what the best fit for them is. Um, so um, another question um, was, oh, and someone also said, great answer, knocks it out of the park. So Good job. <laughs> um, I've been graded by my future students. I love There you go. Yeah, you got some feedback. Um, use on your teacher eval. Um, so someone said, uh, I'm still deciding, but I hope to study history or anthropology. What special opportunities are there in these areas of study? Uh, the one, so I'd say two quick things, but then Rebecca, if you want to go, that's great. So anthropology, as you may know, is divided into two chunks, right? There is cultural anthropology, and then there's basically archaeology, people who dig stuff up. And I don't, I can't speak to the cultural anthropology side. I don't know how active faculty are engaged with undergraduates in doing research. It might be a lot, it might be a little, I don't know. But on the archaeology side, super active. Like the faculty there are very research active and they do collaborative work with students. Um, so anyway, if, if you want to dig up things and then make inferences, you're definitely good. Uh, on the cultural side, I, I honestly just don't know. Um, the history department is very good. Uh, if you just if you're grading by teaching evaluations, the history department is one of the best departments on this campus. So comparing against other departments on this campus, and I think obviously if you are interested in American colonial history or just colonial history, uh, global colonial history, I think William and Mary has a fantastic reputation. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is my son went to William and Mary. My daughter did not. She left me and went to Ithaca. But my son went to William and Mary, and I was pretty convinced he would want to study international relations and political science because that's the most interesting thing one could study. He abandoned me early on, right? He took classes in government, and then he took classes in history, and he basically announced after the first two semesters, "See you, Dad. I'm I'm going to be a historian." And uh, that's what he did. So 
he voted with his feet. I think they're they're excellent. All right. And um, another question. I know we're um, got about just about six minutes left. Uh, someone said, "I'm a thousand percent committed uh, and so excited to come to Williamsburg." Do you have any advice for students who have so many interests that they have no idea what to major in? Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and I think that you will find at William and Mary that there are so many students that are in your shoes that are trying to get a little bit of a sampling of many different things before. They commit to their major and even once they choose their major who still have many involvements that are outside of their major that complement what they're interested in um, so i think just a couple of ideas you know i think for your first semester choosing a broad range of classes trying things in different departments definitely make use of faculty office hours um, and you can even reach out to faculty with whom you're not taking a class saying, you know, I'm interested in your, your research, you know, do your homework, look them up online, think about what, what, you know, similarities they might have with your areas of interest, but definitely make use of that networking. William and Mary also has many, many student clubs. That's true of, I think all universities, but especially true at William and Mary. Um, so there are tons of ways to outside of that initial set of classes also get involved intellectually and socially with a really wide range of activities. Um, we talk a lot about how sometimes your, your first internship and your second internship, they might not actually tell you what you wanna do, but they might give you an idea of what you don't wanna do. And that's almost even more valuable because then you can pivot and explore other things. So I would encourage you to think about the clubs, the classes, the internships, all of those experiences as it's a chance to think about where you want to spend your time. And it's absolutely okay if you don't enjoy those first things, know that there's many more ideas out there and many more opportunities to get involved. Totally agree. You're gonna spend your whole life focused on something, like right after you leave undergraduate and you go to graduate school, but then you're gonna become a specialist. You don't need to become a specialist now. Between the ages of 18 and 21, you know, you get to eat, eat from the full smorgasbord on the buffet. So I would, I, I think Rebecca gave great advice. Yeah, this is great advice. I, and we literally have about 500 different student clubs and organizations and, there, and that's not even including our sport clubs and intramurals and all of all, all the different various research opportunities and whatnot. So there's just a ton out there. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to try out various different things. Don't feel like you have to figure it out right away. Cause I feel, I feel like people in high school and um, through college, they feel like they have to pigeonhole themselves. And that's what I love about William Mary is that um, all the incoming freshmen come in undeclared. Um, you don't have to, you're not required to declare a major until the end of your sophomore year, really. So um, you get that breath of fresh air to really try out different areas of interest, which I think is something that's great. Um, so I just want to thank the panelists so much for, for attending and then the attendees as well. Thank you all so much for, for attending this event. Um, if you all have any questions or concerns, please feel free um, to reach out to admission if it's about admission related, um, or you can reach out to any of the um, professors for any particular department. They're happy to talk to prospective students. Um, but yeah, feel free to check out any of our other events this week. And thank you all so much for attending and panelists for joining us and giving your great insight. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Awesome. I'll do the awkward. Goodbye. <laughs> See y'all. Have a good evening. You too.